All right. And Andrew, hello. Thank you for being with us this week. Hello. Hello. So do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Who are you? What's your relationship to the language learning community? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Andrew. Um, my name in the Russian refold server is pretty long, so I won't say that. Uh, but I, I hang out in the in the Russian refold server a lot, um, and sometimes in the sometimes in the central server. Um, my relationship to language learning, I've been learning Russian for like almost exactly three years at this point. I started as a New Year's resolution uh, three years ago, um, and so yeah, I speak English uh, and sort of Russian. And yeah, that's that's the quick overview. And you also are a helper on the Russian server, like a mini mod. I am. Yeah, I don't remember how that happened, but I am. I'm sure I I was involved somehow. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, very cool. And with Russian, you have yourself labeled as stage four. Yeah. So stage four in about three years. How was that? <clears throat> um. That's a good question. Uh, so I would say that like Russian is my main hobby in the sense that it's like the thing that I spend by far the most amount of free time on. Um, so in particular for stage four in three years, it's, I would say that I'm like the absolute weakest stage four that you could possibly be. Um, it's my output has been sort of all over the place um but my input is pretty solid uh so yeah it's like on any given day i could be like honestly i could be like a weak stage three on some on on a given day or i could be like a decent stage four um sort of depends how much coffee i had in the morning i guess i'm not sure so with Russian, what was it like refolding Russian? So people who are not learning Russian may not be aware, but the Russian community is one of our more active communities in refold outside of the Asian languages. Yeah, um, definitely. When I started, uh, when I found refold, I was I had been studying at that point for I don't know, maybe four months, three months, something like that. Um, and almost all of the time that I was spending on language learning was devoted to this sort of like meta language learning of just like, how do you do it best? I was sort of obsessed with that question at that time. Um, and so when I found refold, which effectively ends up just being another group of people who are also obsessed with sort of min maxing language learning. And then also they happen to just be learning the same language. Um, that was like great for me, especially, uh, when I had first started, um, so yeah, I would say that, uh, the Russian server being so active was a lot, gave me a lot of motivation to keep going. Um, especially there being like other successful, um, learners who had, had achieved really, you know, high levels of Russian, um, just sort of like the proof that it can be done, um, I think was a huge help. So. That's like the biggest thing that I've taken away from from Refold, I think, or the Refold yeah, Russian it, server. It seems like there's no shortage of content in Russian. Uh, it seems like there's something for everybody. What really surprised me was how much sort of weeb or weeb adjacent content yeah. there is. So yeah. I love lit RPGs. Um, I usually read them in English. I've read a few in Spanish. Um, lit RPGs are huge. Uh, anime is huge. Manga is huge. Uh, and that is something that sort of surprised me, uh, just from the peripheries, seeing people who get, who got fluent relatively. I'm thinking of like Atinius from mm -hmm. watching VTubers <laughs> yeah. in Russian. Uh, so that was really surprising. Yeah. I, of that sort of content, um, I only really use those sort of like lit RPG type, um, books. Uh, I've never really got i i i used to watch a decent amount of anime but i've never really gotten into it in russian um for whatever reason every time i try watching anime in russian i just get bored really quickly i'm not sure why um not but, sure if i could get past the the voiceovers that they do so yeah, unlike yeah. 
English or Spanish or even Filipino, uh, they don't dub. <laughs> they just record over the original track. Yeah. Yeah. I So Russia in general just has a huge dubbing culture. Um, and like you can go to theaters and, and see dubs. Like you can find dubs all over the place. So they are in general a lot more used to that sort of thing than I think Americans are where, you know, everything is just that doesn't exist for us basically um so like a really funny example of this is i watch a decent amount of sort of like crime dramas and in them somewhat frequently a character will speak in like french or german or something like that and they will dub over that character speaking in french into russian even though it's a Russian, like it's it's a Russian show shot in Russia, and they're having the character speak in a foreign language, and then dubbing over it. So it's like they are producing this locally and then dubbing over it anyway. And sometimes it'll be like a female character speaking, and they'll dub over it with a male character's voice or something like that. Um, so they are just like very very used to that sort of thing, and it like drives me nuts. I can't watch it. So um, yeah, the most animes having that sort of dubbing is a uh, is a big turnoff for me. So. Gotcha. It would be for me as well. Um, the tooling for Russian actually seems really solid as well. You know, when you look at the Japanese tooling, they've got things like Yomi Chan, Yomi Dan. They've got all of this sort of stuff. And with Russian, you've got um, the famous Golden Dict, which mm. is quite quite handy. And there's also a service called Three Ears, I think. Yeah. If you're familiar with them. And yeah. It's sort of like a one-stop shop for doing interactive immersion in Russian. And they've got a lot of like famous shows, like uh, Kuchnia, if you're familiar with it, is on mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, yeah, the tooling is is good. Um, I've used Three Ears only a little bit. I found it. I remember finding it, likely through Refold, and being like super excited, and then just never using it. Um, I think I watched like maybe one episode of. Uh, um, Kuchnia or something like that. Uh, I don't. I don't remember in particular. But um, yeah, that that service actually has other languages as well, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, I think it's got like Czech, maybe a couple more. Yeah, it's. I, I think, think it's, it's mostly primarily Russian. Yeah, it's primarily Russian, and I think just other Slavic languages in general. Um, it sort of has like a janky website as well. It's like it, it has definitely like two thousand five vibes. Um, yeah. So. Which isn't a bad thing necessarily if you're trying to get in a time machine or something but um i i tend to look for new tools try out new tools and then not actually use them after i find them so, so walk us through your journey here yeah um you started language learning the first four months you spent sort of learning the meta knowledge how to learn a language and then you stumbled into refold and what did you do to get because russian is quite different from English, you know. Um, the U.S. government has it as a Category 3 language. Mm -hmm. So it's right up there with, like, Filipino, Vietnamese, sort of these... All the languages that aren't either Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. Yeah. Um, so what did you do? What was what was your process? Um, so when I first started, I basically just wanted to find something that was similar to Duolingo, but not Duolingo. Because even back then, I knew... Duolingo wasn't going to be, it wasn't serious enough for me. I think at that time, like I, I, when I set the new year's resolution, I was very committed to actually doing it and not just like doing it as like a, something that I do when I'm like sitting on the toilet or something. And I'm just like scrolling through Duolingo or I don't, if you scroll through it, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, I, I used Busu when I started, um, which was great for me for getting started because the sort of like their shtick is that at the end of each like chapter or each section or whatever you have to use the words that you just learned um either recording yourself speaking or typing and native speakers who uh are presumably learning some other language on the on the platform can correct you um and so that is how i met uh my main language exchange partner um and also just how i sort of got my foot in the door with russian speaking people in general 
Um, so yeah, I, I used Busu and then I was, I did that for, I don't know, 30 minutes a day or something like that. And I was really committed to, to doing that 30 minutes a day, but I didn't really know what else to be doing. Um, I stumbled upon the comprehensible input sort of methodology somehow. I'm not sure, sure how I did some more research, probably got recommended a Matt versus Japan video, um, and found refold through that. Uh, and that was when I sort of fully changed over my learning to mostly input. Um, I continued to use Busu's. They don't have like a, an Anki sort of spaced repetition method or anything like that, but they have flashcards. Um, so I continued to use that. Um, and I also used the Speakly app, um, which was also super helpful um, for the early stages, I'd say. Okay. And, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with starting a language by using an app like oh, uh, no. Busu um, or even Duolingo. You know, I, I do think that it provides a stepping stone into getting into immersion. Yeah, um, absolutely. I know that our partner, Mr. Salas, is a big fan of Busu. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's totally fine. And then Speakly, they're sort of like a Glossica clone, I think. Yeah. Um, they're very similar to the Glossica platform. And I think it's also a very good platform. Um, they also have a monthly paid option where you can submit voice recordings and then get asynchronous feedback from tutors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have found that helpful as well. Yeah, I... So I sort of on the topic of this, um, when I first started, I was under the impression that like speaking as soon as possible was important. Um, so yeah, using a, a, an app called Speakly, which the main focus of the app is to try and get you speaking as, as quickly as possible. Um, it was an interesting experience coming into Refold after, you know, four or five months of learning, having been speaking the entire time. And then everybody being like, you know, I've been studying for Russian for two years or three years or whatever, and I haven't started speaking yet. Um, so that was like a sort of interesting experience. Um, but because Russian has always been a hobby for me, first and foremost, I sort of operate under the principle of just like doing what seems fun to me at the moment. Um, and often that is speaking, uh, usually to my detriment, um, but you know, here we are. I think output's like a muscle. You got to do it to, to stay good at it. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah. I've seen people, particularly in the Russian community, fall into this trap where they do hours and hours and hours of input, and then they still do not produce great output. Yeah, Russian's hard to speak. I, I, ha I haven't figured out how to speak in Russian yet. Um, it's it's just hard. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's in it's particular tricky. Russian, but... it's So Russian has a few things that I'm, and I'm just spitballing here, would make it be difficult. First off, it's got irregular stress. Yeah. Um, it's not like every second to last syllable is stressed or every last syllable is stressed. Um, it really depends on the word. Um, it's got all that palatiz palatalization, the soft mm -hmm. consonants, the hard consonants. It's got a lot going on. It's got that weird uh, vowel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and to top it off, the grammar is a little bit different from some languages, you know. Uh, Russian's fusional, and you have to worry about case endings, and um, you have the two different types of uh, verbal aspects, so each verb has two forms. Um, there's a lot going on that I could see being difficult with Russian. Yeah, I think the thing for me at this point is very often just the way that thoughts are expressed in Russian is just different. It's not even necessarily better or worse. It's just they express things in a different way. Um, and that just catches me off guard. Even even today, it catches me off guard every once in a while. Um, and yeah, like uh, every once in a while, I'll say something, a full long thought, and a Russian person like might not even be able to understand what it is because I've some something in my brain is like anglic anglic anglicized something about like the way that this thought is conveyed uh and yeah it doesn't get 
conveyed as a result. Um, so yeah, that's that's like the biggest thing that I'm, I think I'm trying to overcome at this point is like trying to get rid of all of the English influences on my Russian. Yeah, I think more input is my yeah. only answer there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also getting feedback whenever you, you know, if you do have a, a partner or a tutor who can give you like, well, this is not how we would say that. We would say it differently. Yeah. It really help. Yeah, I, I definitely plan on doing more writing because my experience speaking with natives is that they are much more willing to give you feedback on the sort of natural soundingness of your uh, speech if it's in written form. So, And writing has the advantage of they can do it asynchronously as well. You know, you can yep. post a message or, or post on like journaly or something. And they don't have to be like right there interrupting you to give you feedback. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, journaling is something that I'm looking to use. Uh, I'm working right now on my New Year's goals. Um, and some sort of regimented writing is something that I would like to uh, get in there. You should post your goals on the Refold Central server. I will. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. The community is really good at helping you break down your goals, and people who've been there and done that can give you better actionable items. One thing that I see a lot is people, they're like, I'm going to do XYZ, but they don't tell you the steps they're going to take to do XYZ. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like, draw a circle, draw the rest of the owl, uh, <laughs> steps in between. Yeah. Yeah, I, so, I've definitely made that mistake. Uh, just even this last year when I set goals for my for my Russian. So yeah, regarding Russian, um, going back to using Busu, mm. one thing that Russian does not have is a good pathway to immersion. Um, and what I mean by that is there are no good Anki decks. The refold community tried to make an Anki deck and it's it's mm. solid, but even that assumes that you know like a hundred or so words in Russian. Um there's not a lot of like good beginner apps and stuff out there as far as I can tell. Um, but once you're past that initial couple hundred word hump, there's the refold community deck, which is quite good. And Russians seem to really, really like TPRS. You know, you've got like Russian with Max and Real Russian Club, and there's a whole bunch of comprehensible content out there to get you and bridge that gap into native content. But the ultra beginner level kind of seems not so easy. Yeah, there's like, there's like two playlists that I know of on YouTube that are sort of labeled zero beginner, where it's all in Russian, but it's for people who know literally zero words. But outside of those two YouTube playlists, um, there's not a ton out there. But yeah, I, I would agree that like, for the sort of like A1, A2 levels, there's a ton of really great content. Um, another one is about Russian in Russian, uh, which is like a channel that's focused on grammar but she only speaks in russian um that's an incredibly useful i would say that like 60 percent of my grammar knowledge came from that channel so uh that's another good good one to recommend russian in russian there's also russian with max real russian club mm -hmm. and i'm sure there are more that i'm forgetting yeah russian progress is another one uh, which is good for, he basically speaks at like a somewhat normal tempo, but somehow he limits his vocabulary. And so it makes it easier to understand, but it doesn't feel like he's sort of hampering himself. Um, that was like the, I can definitely credit a decent chunk of my progress at some point to just like spamming literally every video that he made. So, um, that's another good one. Yeah, the, the Russian environment for YouTube seems pretty solid. Um, it's got a whole bunch of content for everything. You know, if you're interested in nerd stuff, you want to talk about World of Warcraft, you want to talk about anime, you want to talk about physics, it all seems to be there. And I'm pleasantly surprised at the amount of like linguistic stuff out there. Like there's Phonetic Fanatic, mm -hmm. where he talks all about, you know, English phonology in Russian. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, there's, I think one of the benefits of it is that there are just a lot of speakers of Russian. 
and it's it's kind of a lingua franca in that sort of post-soviet uh air area of the world um so there's a lot of russian people who russian speaking people who don't speak english at all um so they have like more of a need i guess to create their own content um in that area so which i'm you know happy to consume as a result sure. and um There's what's his name Ilya Frank. There's like a polyglot who, who really believes in like bilingual texts. Um, oh yes, and, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Ilya Frank, I think is his name, and that's just really cool. You know, it feels like there's a lot out there for Russian, and a lot to do in Russian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish the the Refold Community Deck could be started on day zero though. Um, the deck assumes that you know the first hundred or so most common words. Um, and if yeah. I were to, if I were to change it, <laughs> I would make those flashcards, even if they're not in sentences. I know that it tries to be, you know, one T sentences and build on itself, but I hate telling people when they come to me and they're like, Clayton, where do I start Russian? I'm like, well, do the first hundred words elsewhere and then do the refold community deck. <laughs> yeah, I would honestly even recommend waiting longer than a hundred words. I would recommend like a thousand or something like that only because the, a lot of the cards in the Russian refold deck are great for learning what I would say is like quote unquote real Russian, where it relies on already having an understanding of the cases um, and an understanding of like, almost like which words you can drop and still get the same meaning across um and so as a result it's like even if you know the first hundred words you can come across a sentence and not understand at all what is being said because they've dropped the the verb like to go and it's just assumed because you used tuda that you know you know the person is going somewhere because that assumes movement um and so i think there are a lot of moments like that in in the russian 15k deck um, which can be daunting for beginners where it's like, this is supposed to be a card where I'm supposed to understand everything but one word, but I actually don't understand anything on this card, even though I know all of the words but one. Um, like, I just don't understand how the sentence is constructed. So um, I would say that that would be one of the things that would that is more difficult about the deck than you might expect. And with Russian, what was sort of the content that you used? So we know there are people out there like uh, Atinius who used a whole bunch of sort of weeb adjacent content. Um, and I know that we've talked in the past about you having used graded readers. Um, what sort of walk me through what you did to get to stage four? Um, so the path that I've taken, I would say, is like pretty winding in the sense okay. that even within my sort of refold my time at refold, whatever that means, I've changed the sort the types of content that I'm in, engaging in, types of things that I feel like I'm learning from. Um, so, you know, like as an example, I, I, I didn't really start understanding how to read almost until like early 2023, so like a year ago. Um, so like in 2022, I read some graded readers. I read maybe like two or three kids, kids books. Um, but something about the way that Russian is written in book form, uh, just like wasn't clicking for me. Um, so yeah, I've changed a lot, the sorts of content that I engage with, I would say. Um, but the first domain that I got to whatever five uh, under comprehension or stage six comprehension, I, I forget what what comprehension level you're supposed to get before you move on was language learning advice, basically. Um, so like consuming that sort of content, but in Russian, um, because I, I realized in my first year that even though I was still studying Russian, like on the side, I was still consuming language learning content on in in English. Um, and so I was just like, okay, I just, I need to stop consuming language learning content. 
in English at the very least. And so I just found similar channels, but in Russian. Um, and those were the first videos that I was able to actually get to a high level of comprehension. Um, and yeah, so language learning sort of advice content adjacent, even if I don't agree with the advice that, that is being given in the videos, I think just like engaging in that sort of content was good for me. Um, and since then I'm, I've expanded into like a lot of video games. Um, I'm, I've watched like so many like crime dramas, all, all of them set in like the 18th, uh, 19th century, um, 1800s. I, I don't know why. Um, those are terrible to consume also, by the way, I would not recommend that because in those series, they frequently talk to like the lower classes and the way that they show that people are from a lower class is they have them speak in this, like in Russian, they call it like, what do they call it? It's like simple speech. That's like a bad translation into English, but that's effectively what it is. Um, and so it's like old style, simple speech, which is like the most useless thing that you could possibly immerse in. Um, but you know, that's the sort of content that I enjoy. So, um, that that's been like a, a big chunk of it as well. Um, just sort of like detective related content. So like I've listened to all of Sherlock Holmes in Russian. Um, I've listened to like a decent chunk of Agatha Christie in Russian. Obviously neither of them are Russian. Um, and, uh, I've read a decent amount of, of detective sort of related content as well. Um, which I think is a good domain also to in, in immerse in because you get, you get similar words over and over again, obviously for, for the domain, like clue, following the lead, fatal mistake, those sorts of things. Um, but then because the situation changes each time, you can get sort of somewhat more specific, uh, vocabulary in those areas as well. Interesting. And is that like a big genre for Russians? I know that with like Danish and with German, the the sort of the crimis they call them are quite big. Yeah, I would say that like there is there is like some of a feeling of a lot of content that is made that takes place towards the end of the Russian Empire, but before any of the revolutions started. Um, and I don't know if that's sort of like a collective nostalgia sort of thing, sort of like the way that we think about like the wild west in America. Um, that's like the closest analog that I could come up with on the fly. But, um, there's a lot of that sort of content, um, that I've found. So, um, yeah, there's a decent amount Very of it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I know at some point your wife started immersing as well and mm -hmm. doing some language learning. So how has that been? Because I believe you started language learning before her. Um, how did yeah. you sort of mentoring her and getting her set up on Spanish? Yeah. So she, uh, it's much more of a hobby for her than, than it, or I guess what I would say is it doesn't, her life doesn't revolve around it the same way that mine, okay. mine does. Um, so she, yeah, she took Spanish in high school um, and, you know, went through like AP Spanish or whatever, uh, didn't use it at all in college or, or since, um, and then was interested in hopping back into it after I'd done Russian for like a year or so. Um, and had sort of done all of the legwork of figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, so her routine is pretty straightforward and to the point, um, I you know, she uses vocab Steve and Anki, but I do all of the uploading for vocab Steve for her. So she doesn't even have to like figure out how to use the tool. I just like do it for her. Um, every, every, you know, every time she finishes a book. Um, and then, yeah, she just like listens to content and reads content. Um, she, she is like, she doesn't have a goal of like trying to master Spanish or anything like that. The way that I sometimes think I do. Um, with Russian. So yeah, she probably has like maybe a healthier relationship to her language learning than, than I do. Um, but you know, 
What can you do? Yeah. I, I do have to say, you know, anywhere in the state, Spanish is just incredibly useful. Yes. You know, yes. Anywhere. My... I'm from a town of 300 people. And even then, there was a Spanish church, some sort of Protestant church. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. There was a Spanish speaking meat market. Um, because, you know, being from a rural area, there's a lot of, you know, uh, day laborers and migrant workers. And um, even in a place where you would not expect Spanish, like outside of the outside of South Florida or outside of California or the Southwest, there is Spanish and it's useful. Yeah. And even just being able to to talk and speak basic things was useful to me. I was able to help people who would come into my rural store. I used to be a, a night shift manager at a store in the countryside mm -hmm. and help them find things and, you know, explain to them things was useful. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that about the usefulness. Uh, but recently, like a few months ago, my sister-in-law and her boyfriend came and stayed with us and he is uh, Venezuelan, so he speaks Spanish obviously fluently natively um and over the course of like the weekend that they stayed with us he had like six opportunities to use spanish probably three of which actually were like incredibly helpful and and borderline necessary and so i was like i was just sitting there like twiddling my thumbs like man someday someday russian is gonna is gonna come in handy i've only actually had to use russian a single time uh in the states so far um, and even had to is a little bit of an overstatement, to be honest. Um, so uh, I yeah. think, um, in some places in New York city, Russian is very useful. Oh yes. No, certainly. I, when I went to New York this past year, I counted the number of times that I heard Russian around me. Um, I didn't need to use it any times, but I, I heard Russian around me like four or five times a day. There's like a whole Russian speaking enclave somewhere in Brooklyn. Yeah, in Brighton Beach. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, I've I, I've not been, but I've heard from other people from many different people that it feels like a, sort of like a chunk of the Soviet Union that has not progressed through time. Um okay. so yeah, I, I might end up going sometime this year. Uh, I already have some plans to go to New York, but if I can convince the friends that I'm visiting to go to Brighton Beach with me, uh, that's, that's sort of still up in the air. Very cool. So regarding, you mentioned earlier that you want to master Russian. Um, and do you have any like plans on taking the Russian proficiency test? Uh, so I've, I mean, I've taken the C1 exam and passed it. Okay. Um, so like I've done that. Uh, you've done it. Yes. That was, that was my, that was my goal for last year was just pass the C1 exam. Um, which and I did. How was that? What was it? Like? Uh, terrible. I would say, um, <laughs> the, so my experience with the exam was, I sort of went into it with rose colored glasses. I forget exactly what rose tinted glasses, something like I think that. Rose colored works. Yeah. Uh, you understand what I'm saying. Um, where I was just like, the skills that you need to be good at a language perfectly map one to one onto the things that you need for the exam. Uh, that is not true, it turns out. It's um, no. Uh, in, in fact, it's very different. Um, so, I've, I have a blog where I, you know, write about my Russian learning experience. Um, and I have a lot of content in there about my C1 sort of journey. Um, but it was a lot of studying things that are not super useful and don't translate into what I would consider to be like actual mastery of the language but are just sort of like puppeting mastery of the language. Um, and this isn't really a criticism of like the people who make the exam or anything like that. I think making exams that accurately reflect mastery of a language is just inherently a difficult thing to do. Um, so I'm not like throwing shade on the examiners or anything like that. I think it's just a really difficult 
um, thing to do. And like they came up with a lot of really interesting uh, like tasks that you have to do on the exam, but ultimately like I prepared a lot more to pass the exam as opposed to just trying to sort of holistically improve my Russian, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's sort of where that stands. I think, um, I have no plans to take the C2 exam. Um, the C2 exam for Russian is like, for whatever reason, significantly more difficult and has this sort of like, is it called mysterious... purple in English? Is that the test? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. So I used to tutor English and I, I did so for about five years. Mm -hmm. And my experience as a tutor, I would have people come to me who wanted to pass the exam, either the test of English as a foreign language or the IELTS. And my biggest piece of advice for these students was study the exam, study how many minutes you have, the format of the exam and what they're actually grading you on. Because like you said, it doesn't transfer one to one. And just knowing how the test works uh, gives people a big leg up. Yeah, I could have spent more time on that sort of thing. I'll just, I'll say that. <laughs> so you walked in and uh, it, you quickly realized that you had a rose sort of tinted view of the exam. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to pass the exam last year. And so the way that I went about it was I'm just going to sign up for the exam and take it and see what where I'm at right now, what sort of grade I'm able to get at, at my current level. And that was in March of last year. Um, and I got like sort of exactly what you would expect from somebody who is in refold. I scored really high on the input related things, really low on the output related things and, and even lower on grammar. Um, so I had to focus on my output this year and my grammar, um, but but it was constrained to the sorts of output that they want from you, um, which is just not at all the sorts of output that I was doing even up to that point. Um, so like an example was like, you watch a video where like people are doing things that like you may or may not consider to be wrong. And then you have to like give a speech on that video and like summarize your thoughts and like come to a conclusion and like advise people on like what they what they should have done in that situation. That is not something that I have ever done in English, I think. Um, it's not something that I've done in Russian since taking the exam. I highly doubt that it will ever be something that I'm going to do in Russian. So there's a lot of those sorts of things where the sorts of output that they wanted from you were not what was not aligned with your actual sort of mastery of the language. Interesting. Yeah, well, congrats on the C1. Thanks. I wasn't aware. Yeah, I passed that like a month and a, a month and a half ago or something or a month ago. So it's still fairly fresh. Yeah, but that's really exciting. I mean, a little under three years. Yeah. So why Russian, if I can ask? You said that you started it on a, not a whim, sort of, um, New Year's three years ago. Mm -hmm. Why Russian of all the languages? Yeah. So my answer to this has changed throughout my studying, but effectively it boils down to, I didn't want to do one of the East Asian languages because those seemed too hard, just, you know, blanket sort of statement uh but i didn't and i also didn't want to do something that was like super common in the states uh, despite the them that sort of choice being much more useful uh presumably um so that sort of narrowed it down and then from there i had read a lot of russian literature that year um and sort of had this sort of like mythical understanding of of russian literature and and russia in that time period in general um and so i just thought okay I, i'll do russian then even though i had no plans to actually read russian literature in russian like 
I didn't, I wasn't learning it so that I could read Russian literature. It was just like, I read Russian literature. I have no other languages that I have like any sort of connection to. So yeah, I'll, I'll just do Russian. That sounds like that would be fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. In our Russian community, it's uh, the people I interact with, um, are very eccentric with their Russian input. Um, you know, I think of, of Jack and he really loves central asia mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff out of kazakhstan and travel logs and things like that and i think of atenius and he's very big into the sort of the weeb culture the nerd culture so there's a lot of vtubers and anime and uh talking about video games um i've yet to meet anyone who says i want to read russian literature in the original um i'm sure they exist but yeah the 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 slice of the pie where they're also in refold uh, yeah. might not be very large. Yeah, I think that the issue is that Russian literature, the sort of golden age of Russian literature, as it's called, is written in not old Russian, but it's the the texts are very hard even for native speakers. So the amount of studying that you have to do to be able to enjoy them in Russian is just like so high and and takes so much time that for the usual person who is interested in Russian literature, it's just a better idea to read it in English instead of spending, you know, 4,000 hours studying Russian so that you can read. And there are Dostoevsky. some graded versions of Russian classics, right? That are yeah. Like, this is an A2 level yeah. version of this book, which I think is kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. No, like I've read, I read an, uh, an Anna Karenina one. Uh, which was, I think it was like rated B1 or something like that. Um, and yeah, that was great, but it's not, it's not Tolstoy. So it's just like a different experience, obviously. You know, the times that I've read older literature in English too, I can understand why people may not want to do it in their foreign language. Yeah. Um, just last week, I, I'm a big horror fan mm -hmm. and I had never read um, Lovecraft in, you know, I've read Lovecraftian stuff, but never actually read Lovecraft. And um, he was, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take my web novels, like the concepts were good, but they were not yeah. executed in a way that I would like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, writing styles have changed and uh, I can understand people not, not wanting to tackle Tolstoy. Yeah, yeah. It's just difficult just to the long and short of it is that it's difficult. Like reading Dostoevsky in your native language is just difficult because he wrote, you know, he has a thousand words without pressing the space bar or without hitting a period or something like that. And it's just mentally taxing um, no matter what language it is. So then if it's also on top of the, you know, on top of your native language, if it's in a different language, it's just, it's going to be a slog. Yeah. But the cool thing about Russian, again, is there's just so much literature out there. And I don't mean older literature. Uh, you've got relatively <coughs> recent authors who put out things like um, there's like the Russian Harry Potter. I've, I've heard it called that. Mm -hmm. um, and do you know what I'm talking about? I can't think of the name. I think you're probably talking about Vita Nostra. I am. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the book that Atenius uh, loves. And, and I like it as well. Um, I think it's like I think he says that it's his favorite book. Um, so I actually saw that in a Barnes and Noble in, in English the other day, um, even though it's like a I think it came out like maybe two years ago or three years ago, something like that. So um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, and uh, again, I'm a big fan of like Royal Road and Wattpad and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can get a lot of this sort of web fiction in Russian, which is really cool. Yeah, there's a lot of that sort of thing. I think like Russians in general don't like to pay for things. So Wattpad and those sorts of like animes where the dub is just on top of the old and like that, that is all sort of fits right into the, the Russo sphere um, of how they consume content uh, in their native language. So yeah, there's lots of that. Yeah, there is a lot. And um, you, t you touched on this earlier, Russian being a lingua franca, mm -hmm. which I think is really neat. You know, you can meet people from Kazakhstan or, you know, Uzbekistan and 
maybe Russian is the only language that you can share with them, right? Because very few people are learning Kazakh. Mm -hmm. It's sort of yeah. like English and like Southeast Asia and South Asia, you know. Um, you've got Pakistan, you've got India, you've got Malaysia, you've got Singapore, the Philippines, where English is used as sort of a lingua franca. Yeah, I would love to travel in the sort of like Russo sphere, uh, the post Soviet Union area um, and make use of my Russian, but it's far uh, and I have other, far. other travel plans um, this year. So maybe someday. For sure, being far away and, um, you know, countries that don't have the same sort of infrastructure can be quite difficult, food safety mm -hmm. standards. There's a lot of reasons why you may put off traveling. Yep. But Brighton Beach is just right down the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I, I'm like a little bit nervous to go there, to be honest, uh, but I will probably end up going there at some point. Uh, but yeah. So you mentioned that after Russian, you may do Spanish. What's what? Don't get my hopes up. But what's the the likelihood of that happening? Um, I would say medium. I, I'm ultimately I'm interested in Spanish for two reasons. One, it's just incredibly useful, obviously. Um, and then two is what it would be like to start a foreign language today knowing all that i know about like what works for me what doesn't work for me um so i would say that there's like a decent chance that i eventually end up taking up spanish um especially when i get to the point where it feels like i can just consume any russian content without significant difficulty i th I, I think most russian content that i consume today is like fairly straightforward for me but not all and there are definitely times where it's like I like don't understand an entire sentence whatsoever, even though I know most of the words, just because it's like something about it is just like my brain is not clicking. Um, so it, it's not to the point where Russian feels what native. What domains and what genres give you the most trouble as a C1 Russian speaker? <laughs> Calling me a, a Russian speaker is a uh, Russian, no, I, I, Russian I know what you mean. language user. Yeah. Uh, Person no, who I mean, understands I, Russian. Yeah, and, and I am a Russian speaker in the sense that, like, I have my italki lessons and I speak the whole time fine. Like, it doesn't, like, hurt my brain or anything like that. Um, when I have my language exchanges, I, I'm able to be understood fairly easily. Um, so in some sense, yes, I am a, a Russian speaker, despite that just sort of, like, sounding a little bit off to my ears. Um, sorry, I forgot the question. Uh, well, I'll go back to the question in a second. Speaker identity is huge. Yeah. And you don't currently have the speaker identity of being a speaker of Russian, and that's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, but the question was, what currently gives you problems? So mm. you've passed the C1 exam. You're stage four in Russian. Um, what areas do you struggle with? Domains. Yeah. It could be like, I don't understand religious things. Um, or it could be, you know, something else. Yeah, Where I certainly don't struggle. understand religious things. Uh, Religion is difficult. Not only yeah. is the language archaic, um, it can be a cultural thing too. You know, in the Philippines, I go to these Catholic things and like I'm holding a candle and like doing these things and I'm not Catholic. I have no clue what's going on. <laughs> it's a cultural thing at that point. I wasn't mm -hmm. raised Catholic, I'm not Catholic. Uh, and then I'm taking part in these Catholic rituals, you know, like being the godfather of a baby or something and I have no clue what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that that's, that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, so I'm not religious at all. So um, I have no desire to, you know, immerse in um, Russian religious content, though we do have a, a couple of people who are sort of upper level who uh, immerse in a lot of like sort of religious content. But I think for me, like the most, for the most part, the things that are difficult for me are when people are using non-standard speech. And what I mean by that is like, they're crying or they're screaming or, you know, that just that sort of thing where it's like, 
there's some sort of like intense emotion involved and they're changing their speech in in a very significant way um most of the content that i listen to is like podcasts or conversations or audiobooks or you know just that sort of thing and so when people are in a conversation one person speaks another person speaks a third you know a third person speaks and then somebody yells and like what they yell is the sort of like key thing that you need to understand to the, the thing to take away from that scene and then it moves on to the next scene you know in a tv show or something like that that's where i i like sort of lose the plot um and it, and it gets difficult for me um so yeah i would say that it's not necessarily domain specific like i mean there are certainly domains where i wouldn't be able to understand the things um like i recently started watching uh, a lot of like city skylines which is a video game where you like build a city uh started watching a lot of content for that in russian and you know there's a lot of words that i don't necessarily know uh like i learned the word for skyscraper um and just sort of you know that sort of content where it's like uh water sanitation plant or you know nuclear energy plant those sorts of words where the first time i hear them i, I won't understand them and then you know they're not hard to pick up um but i think like definitely like screaming crying yelling those, those sorts of emotive states are are still very difficult for me whispering probably is up there as well very interesting. And then do you have much exposure to the non-standard Russian spoken by advanced L2s? So what I mean by that is, um, you know, I have previously, as an English teacher, had students who are like, I've got a coworker from uh, Malaysia or Singapore mm -hmm. or um, South Africa or something where they don't, you, you know, sometimes the variety is different. Right, a Kazakh speaker of Russian may do things differently, um, and that can be an issue. Because what I understand with Russian is that standard Russian is very big, mm -hmm. and a lot of people speak the standard. Um, I've noticed, at least with the Russian learners, they don't seem super exposed to the sort of basilectal L2 working class, you know, person from Uzbekistan who may speak Russian but not russian russian you know what i mean yeah yeah i would say that like i would have a very hard time understanding somebody who is speaking sort of like a broken russian um especially if they have a, a thick accent um m mostly just because like 99 percent of the russian content that i consume is from native speakers of russian who speak this sort of standard dialect um and that that last one percent is like uh, like Ukrainian people who speak with like they they change the G into a like a th sound some like some of them do. Um, well, Southern Russian in in yeah. Russia does that as well. Yeah, ex yeah, exactly. Um, so like that is like the the furthest away that I get from standard Russian is like just that one that one shift and the vowels change a little bit as well, but it, that's less important. Um, but I, I remember like in in Kuchnia, there's a character who uh she is from i think uzbekistan um and my comprehension drops to like two when she's speaking even though which i think partially it's from uh her being like a non-native quote-unquote non-native speaker of russian um and partly because most of the time when she's speaking it's like delivering a punchline um and so if i don't get the joke on top of her speaking and in sort of intentionally uh non-standard non-native version of russian might just comprehension is suffers for it so and andrew we are nearing the end of our hour thank you for coming on um before we go is there anything that i didn't ask that you wanted to talk about while you've got the floor um anything you didn't ask that i'd like to talk about uh i guess like my plans for the new year um 
since I've passed the only exam that I have any plans to ever take, uh, I'm sort of out searching for new goals to keep myself accountable for Russian. Um, and so one of the things that I'm attempting right now is doing my own translation of Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, um, which is hard. So I think that that'll be like a really fun, interesting goal for the year. Um, the, the text itself is not super long. It's maybe like 100 pages in English. Um, but I'm looking forward to trying to sort of dive deep on every individual word instead of the typical refold sort of like tolerate ambiguity uh, advice. Um, just because I, I have not done that yet where I'm like actually studying like literally every single word trying to understand truly what the whole meaning is and like what the meaning is in the context of other books that were released at that time and like what references Dostoevsky is making and like all of those sorts of things. Um, that's I think what I'm looking to get out of next year. So yeah, I would say that that's like the main goal that I'm working that I think I'm going to work towards. Um, it's possible that I give up, you know, after a month because it's like, this isn't fun anymore. And I only do things if, if, for Russian. I usually only do things if they're enjoyable to me. So, um, yeah. And what is your advice to people who are learning Russian? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I think that my thinking around how to learn Russian has just changed a lot as I've gone through and and progressed. Um, I think just like trying to listen as much as possible is what I would emphasize. Um, just because like I have, there are some fossilized errors that I have in my speech that are just due to me speaking before I had really, really internalized the sort of prosody of this of the language. Um, so I think like for my advice would just be to listen as much as possible before speaking. Um, yeah, because yeah, there's just some fossilized parts of my speech that are tough to get rid of. Gotcha. So no early output. <laughs> Yeah, I would say, or I guess, I mean, ultimately it depends on what your goal for the language is. Like if you're trying to become a spy in the CIA and you need to be able to speak Russian as if it's your native language, like that's a different thing than if you're just trying to read web novels in Russian. So my advice would be join the Russian refold community. Um, yeah, it is one of the strongest, most lively uh, most helpful communities that we have outside of the East Asian languages. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I'm not in any of the other Re Russian, or sorry, in any of the other refold communities, so I can't actually compare, but I would agree that the Russian community is great uh, in refold. All right. And Andrew, thank you for coming on. I learned a lot. And I think this is going to be a very useful episode for people learning Russian. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a ton of fun. So. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Refold Podcast. If you're watching the live premiere, you're in luck. Right as it ends, we have an after party over on the Refold Central Discord server. Come join us by using refold.link forward slash join and chat about the episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear more, you can find older episodes to listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Let us know what you thought about the video by liking and leaving a comment below. Do you have suggestions for upcoming visitors or requests for particular topics? Please feel free to reach out to me on Discord at georgepig hashtag 5413 or via email at clayton at refold.la. Thank you all for watching and or listening, and I'll see you next week. Hey, as you know, there's a lot of language learning advice out there, which can make it kind of overwhelming and difficult to actually get going on your own learning. If you feel like you're struggling to figure out language learning, you're not alone. 
It's an extremely complicated process with tons of different steps. If you're looking for a step-by-step -step guide to create the perfect language learning routine for you, then you have to check out our new course. We spent thousands of hours designing a simple and straightforward process that you can use to create your own personalized language routine that actually works. We understand that every learner is different and that you have to roll with the punches and adapt. Every day for 30 days, I walk you through everything you need to know to build an effective learning routine, no matter your circumstances. We give you the advice and resources you need to ensure your success, so you don't have to waste time looking for stuff to do and can focus on learning. And if any questions do come up, don't worry. We are always there to answer any questions and clear up confusion. And it's all backed by our 90 day, no questions asked money back guarantee. If for whatever reason, something's not quite working for you, we insist you get every penny back. It's time for you to stop wishing that you could learn a second language. It's time to become the master of your language learning journey. Check out the link below to get instant access and start your journey today.